For 75% of Ukrainians, corruption remains one of the top concerns, while 63% believe it is highly prevalent in society. Simultaneously, Ukrainians are intolerable of corruption. The share of those who think it should not be justified hits 75%. When asked about corruption, most of Ukrainians think first of all grand and political corruption hidden in the offices of the deputies and top officials. Still, the share of those who think that the prevalence of corruption throughout governmental bodies, with the exception of police, has dropped. But in real life, the share of those who admitted to have faced corruption personally during the previous 12 months fell to 16%. COVID and less contact among people oust traditional person-official interactions. Across the country, experiences of corruption differ from obelisk to obelisk. Only in seven obelisk respondents reported increased levels of corruption, while the rest claimed the same or lower levels. Who has the will to overcome corruption? Citizens, media, and NGOs. However, many are discouraged as they feel anti-corruption fatigue and think their efforts are futile. More than a half vest responsibility for countering corruption in the president and his office. Ukrainians are increasingly confident that this is the responsibility of the specialized anti-corruption bodies like the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office, National Agency for Prevention of Corruption, or the Higher Anti-Corruption Court. Feel this is incomplete? Get a bigger picture at engage.org.ua. за таку надважливу дискусію, яка у нас щойно була. І хочу запросити... Just recently, and now I'd like to invite to the floor Darina Kalinyuk, who is the executive director of the Center for Prevention of Corruption. It is thanks to her efforts that such conversation at the highest level has become possible for the first time in Ukraine. Good afternoon. Greetings. Could you please tell us, when you were thinking about this conference, about hybrid challenge democracy, how did you manage to convince people that Ukraine is the platform for such discussion? Well, you know, Ukraine is actually actually a country where various authoritarian regimes test their hybrid instruments to undermine our development. Well, first of all, I'm talking about the Russian Federation and the Kremlin. For them, Ukraine is a sort of a lab, a lab to test how to undermine the attempts of Ukrainian people to live in a worthy, dignified and prosperous way. But at the same time, as we have all these instruments tested, we also have answers, reactions to this challenge. The, uh, the reaction to disinformation, to corruption, to various legal, legal wars. And we were creating this forum so that our partners in the West, we could explain them that Ukraine's success in countering this threat is actually the success of democracy in general and democracy in the West, in the country of the Western Europe and also the States, because in the beginning they test various disinformation narratives and tomorrow the same disinformation narratives are going to be in Germany, are going to be in the UK, in the United States. For now they don't see it yet, how they are intervening in the elections, but here we see that still in the election, in Yanukovych's elections we saw how various propaganda companies simply moved the country in the wrong direction, in the direction that the Ukrainian people wanted to. If we are talking about expectations, we actually put it as a goal, and our conversation is now taking place before very important meetings like G7 or the NATO. Could you please tell us, how would you evaluate the success of Kyiv conversation? Well, uh, the president, uh, President Joe Biden said that in the end of this year, he is going to have a democracy summit. Well, our success is that our summit and our sincere conversation about democracy action is now happening here in Kyiv. Kyiv is ready for this uh, open conversation about democracy, about the challenges we have before us. Kyiv is also ready to provide solutions to these global challenges. These solutions are interesting here in Ukraine. They are also interesting in a part 
status in Georgia and Moldova, they are also interesting for the countries of developed Europe. And I believe that such things as e-declarations, as uh, selection of judges with the participation of international experts, purification of the court system using innovative models, all this has to do later be transformed and used in other countries. Just uh, to, so all the, those open registers, also something that you can boast in Ukraine. And actually, marathon is just the start to that. After that, there's going to be a whole range of other informal meetings. So there's such instruments uh, actually were introduced in other countries, right? Yes. And for us, this is also very important uh, to talk about these things uh, which are like, you know, an elephant in the room that nobody talks about. Because the Nord Stream 2 is a classic example of strategic corruption. This is a project which undermines not only the Ukrainian economy, not only the possibility of Ukraine as a state to counter the Kremlin. It's also the project that undermines the whole Bay Foundation of Single Europe, United Europe. It divides European countries. This is a project which also undermines you know, this v value calls for uh, in the United States. So on the one hand, President Biden announces that corruption is the foundation, one of the main threats to the national security. But on the other hand, suddenly the sanctions are lifted of companies which build Nord Stream 2, even though such company, this Nord Stream 2, is actually a great example of corruption. That is why I want to openly ask these questions. We invited the representatives from the U.S. and also from the European Union, from Germany, to talk about it. We agree that uh, in Ukraine there are a lot of things to work on. You have to do the uh, court reform. We are working on that hard. But not only Ukraine has to work. Also, democracies in the West have to do and work something. Democracy in action also has to be there in the countries of development democracy, the so-called West. Because, I mean, they can lose these values that they are used to. And Ukraine is a reminder for the countries of developed West, that democracy cannot stand. Uh, this is constant, more constant, more. These are the values that we should actually stand for. And sometimes we have to pay gas a lot. Thanks for raising these uh, questions. Thanks during our marathon and everything. But I know that after working in this studio, there was also work uh, for many months before you actually had this event. In particular, I would like to tell you about one more project in the framework of Democracy in Action Forum. This is called Youth Vision. Uh, the team, uh, the organizer of the conferences, actually understands very well that not a single development of fair and democratic society is possible without the voice of future generations, those in the interest of whom we all doing that, and who very soon is going to approve very important decisions soon enough. That's why we ask young people all around the world, what do they think about democracy, about values, and how they, young people, can now influence uh, the governments of their countries. And now the video follows. Unfortunately, I do not have the sound available, so I cannot interpret. But to achieve justice in our society, we should continue fighting for the rule of law. And we, as a young generation, are ready to stand for democracy in action. Good evening, distinguished guests. Allow me to make three suggestions on this topic of uh, how we respond yep. to human rights violations and strategic corruption. I think it would be wonderful if states could rethink the policies around tax havens, why we have them, and what sort of ta uh, illicit financial flows they enable. Because what I know about my region in Southern Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, is that a lot of the money that's needed to develop our communities, our countries, our regions, is sitting in offshore banks. Another thing is to help countries 
that have less power to name and shame individuals who are acting from outside the country to influence not only policies but decisions and to the point of which minister should sit in which seat. And the UK has recently done that in their integrated review by identifying the family that is responsible for widespread corruption in the South African state in recent times. And finally, help to establish solid norms, new norms that create a fairer environment for all states to inhabit. Those are the things that we can do. Thank you. Our following panel is going to be dedicated to Ukraine's plans to become integrated in the North Atlantic uh, Alliance. So what have we done? What challenges remain? We have a special survey done by New Europe Center. It includes, among other things, questions not just why NATO is an attractive option for Ukraine, but also why Ukraine is important for North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Alena Hikmachuk, the director of the center, is going to present the document based on this survey. Thanks a lot, Ina. Uh, thanks, Inna, for New Europe Center. It is a great honor to be not just a partner of this conference, but also to make an analytical contribution to this uh, conference in the form of such research. We believe that this study is highly timely because in a week, as uh, has been mentioned many times today, there's going to be a NATO summit in Brussels. And at the summit, among other issues, uh, the discussion is planned for the new strategic uh, concept of the alliance until 2030. For Ukraine, it is vital for our, in our opinion, so that during this discussion, there is not just confirmed policy of open doors of the alliance, but also serious discussion about the way this open door policy can be implemented towards Ukraine and Georgia in the following 10 years. Because Ukraine, and we have to remember about that all the time, both in Kyiv and in Brussels, as well as in NATO capitals, is not just the alliance partner, it is also an uh, aspiring country for membership. Uh, please look at our first slide, which actually portrays these two mutually complementing tracks. One of them is Ukraine as the alliance partner and the second would be Ukraine as an inspiring member. So what do we have now as this inspiring country? We have Bucharest's declaration of, this, uh, of 2008, which clearly points out that Ukraine and Georgia are going to become NATO members. That is de facto. We have Euro-Atlantic prospect, which was provided to us in Bucharest. Also, we have uh, the destination point and this destination point would be membership and it was determined in Bucharest. But still, we do not have a roadmap to this destination. And in our opinion and also in our research, we prove why it is important even today to determine and to actually move this uh, route towards membership. Our proposal is for this route to go via reforms. This is what uh, NATO constantly talks about and actually what we constantly talk about. So that this really happens, we propose to develop this very detailed roadmap of the reforms, conditionally calling it as the compatibility plan for Ukraine and NATO. Uh, this roadmap implementation will enable Ukraine to get involved in the alliance and just in one night, as soon as there is a window of opportunity emerging there. That is, this roadmap is not going to contain any clear time parameters. Also, this roadmap may be based or may include an action plan about membership but might not be included, but instead be uh, actually based on available instruments like annual programs, uh, Ukraine, NATO, but this is also a condition by strengthening it. 
as well as the monitoring from NATO. Why this roadmap is important? Why it should also be reviewed jointly with NATO? First of all, uh, from the moment of Bucharest summit at which Ukraine got this Euro-Atlantic prospects, 13 years passed. There is a very serious pause which uh, has to be filled at this integration track. And uh, in 13 years, this actually the confirmation of our aspiring status. Of course, we should be moving the way we are moving as the alliance partner. Last year, you know, Ukraine managed to, uh, to get the status of partner with strength and uh, also the following slide. Such roadmap was very important in the context of reforms. We believe that it would be an additional and serious motivator for all uh, reforming forces in Ukraine. And uh, actually, even this interaction with NATO has already proved that a range of positive transformations and positive changes took place thanks to the interaction with NATO and also that we hope that closer cooperation with NATO is only going to help further on that these reforms take place at least uh, in a range of uh, fields, starting from democratic and civil control and up to the reform of defense procurement, as well as the launch of renewed special services, particular National Security Service of Ukraine. Some of these reforms have already been started, but they have to be continued, and along with NATO at our side is going to be much simpler, similar to the fact how reforms are taking place with the help of action plan on visa regime liberalization with the EU. The following slide, please. The second reason why this is important, because Ukraine made a significant contribution in European Atlantic security, Euro -Atlantic security and we are convinced that it is going to continue making it. Uh, starting from uh, Ukraine's uh, uh, adherence to democratic values that uh, NATO as an alliance also adheres to and which did not allow to establish authoritarian regime in Ukraine twice. It is also about an, its unprecedented um, contribution into the nuclear-free world, uh, also help in pandemic uh, times, a total new case when Ukrainian planes managed to transport 150 tons of medical cargo only in the first half of 2020. It is also a valuable experience in fighting hybrid threats. It's also about our real uh, war experience, the participation in all key operations of NATO, and there are also many other things which are very important and emphasize that Ukraine is capable of making that contribution. The last thing to note is in NATO they are talking a lot about the risks. Uh, that if Ukraine and Georgia are invited in the alliance. But in our study, we prove and we explain, it is for the first time that we write about it and we analyze it, uh, about the risks of non-inviting Ukraine and Georgia to the alliance, because we believe that these risks are also going to be significant. And quite possibly one of the most significant would be the risk of losing Ukraine's uh, uh, state as such, because pro-Russian forces might win, and for them Ukraine as a nation state is not uh, valuable. And also it is associated with the for future aggression of Russia, because Russia has felt very well that it, it just can create new and new conflicts to block the integration of Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. Summing up, in NATO they constantly say that Ukraine should concentrate on the reforms. We heard that today from Mircea Joanne. We believe that, yes, let us jointly concentrate on the reforms. Let us try to agree this roadmap, this plan of compatibility with NATO, whose it is going to be, uh, whether it's not going to include the membership plan is another question. Our final goal is membership, not the action plan about membership. And if NATO still has enough political will after this Bucharest summit, 
because at that time they recognized that Ukraine and Georgia are going to become members of the alliance. I hope that it's going still to have enough political will so that we could jointly develop a roadmap to our destination, namely membership in the alliance. Thanks a lot for your attention. Alona, thank you and your team for the evaluation of risks. It is extremely important. We continue a conversation about Ukraine's prospects on NATO membership in the format of a panel discussion. And I already have guests. That's Kartagina Pusarska, who is the co-head of Warsaw Security Forum. Okay, dear Kartagina. Thank you so much, Ina. It's great to be here. Let me start with uh, congratulating the organizers. It's an immense event, uh, and Hanna Hopko, Daria Kalesniuk have done an amazing job. So thank you for, for, for this opportunity. Thank you for joining us. And since our next panel will be mostly focused on Na uh, Ukraine's and Georgia's perspectives of NATO uh, uh, joining, could you better remind us about the perspectives or the experience of Poland uh, of, your, uh, of your integration into NATO? Yes, I think one of the most important things to remember is that the Polish successful transformation from a central uh, planned economy, communism, to democracy was due to the fact that we decided to join Western institutions, including the EU and NATO. NATO was for us a defense umbrella, while uh, at the same time, EU gave the economic opportunities, the amazing economic opportunities uh, that we saw so needed. And it, it was this perspective, the enlargement perspective, that at the end of the day uh, made us want to do the reform. It was a bipartisan, very strongly uh, pushed from all sides of the political spectrum uh, effort uh, to join NATO, to join the European Union, and all the painful reforms we had to go through were in a huge, uh, uh, um, one of the huge reasons we were able to um, implement them was exactly enlargement. And I think when we talk about Ukraine and Georgia and NATO, it's uh, very important to remember that this carrot stick, uh, but also this kind of very clear vision uh, of where Ukraine is heading along with us, the Western alliance the transatlantic community is key for successful Ukrainian reforms. And I hope to speak about this today with our panelists uh, and with our distinguished speakers. Can't wait this conversation to start. So, Katarzyna, the floor is yours. In a few seconds, we continue. Thank you so much, Ina. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Katarzyna Pisarska and I'm the co-founder and co-chair of the Warsaw Security Forum. It's my immense pleasure to be moderating today's uh, session uh, at the Zero Corruption Conference entitled Ukraine and Georgia in NATO 2030, Alliance's Open Door Policy as a Tool of Enhancing Democracy and Good Government. We have a, a distinguished lineup of speakers that will be joining me uh, momentarily. Among others, uh, the Pro Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine on European and Euro-Atlantic integration, Ms. Uh, Olga Stefanishina, uh, but also uh, Rasa Junkiewicina, the, the member of European Parliament and also former president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and from Georgia, the co-founder and vice president of the Georgian Institute for Strategic Studies, Irakli Prochi, uh, which will again, as I said, uh, be um, discussing this important issue. But before we start our panel, I want to take us all across the Atlantic for these kind of framing remarks uh, that will be done by another special guest uh, of our today's discussion. I want to welcome uh, here Mrs. Lara Cooper, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Defense uh, uh, in the United States, uh, who, will, uh, who will give us, uh, again, framing remarks on a very important aspect of any type of aspirational um, enlargement, which is the, the military, the question of reforms of the defense. 
and that specific agenda. Uh, Madam Cooper, it's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, as uh, we were told, we, uh, we are looking forward to, for short opening remarks, and if you will allow, I will follow that up with a few questions. So, Madam Cooper, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening from the Pentagon. I wish I could be with you in person in Kyiv, but for now, video from the Pentagon will have to do. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to discuss an issue that I think about very frequently, the critical issue of defense reform. And I also want to provide some thoughts on the US-Ukraine defense relationship particularly in light of Russia's recent saber rattling and its buildup of forces in Crimea and along Ukraine's borders. To begin, I would like to reiterate America's unwavering support for Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and Euro-Atlantic aspirations. Ukraine is a critical partner on the front line of Russian aggression. Russia occupies Crimea and fuels conflict in the Donbass in its attempt to change borders by force. We must not accept this as a fait accompli. Russia's aggression is not only a matter for Ukraine. It is a threat to Europe, to the United States, and to the stability of the international order. The United States has long understood that the projection of strength and unity amongst its NATO allies and partners are vital components to deter Russian aggression and coercion. In that vein, the United States is committed to ensuring that NATO's door remains open to aspirants when they are ready and able to meet the commitments and obligations of membership and to contribute to security in the Euro-Atlantic area. To that end, we continue to work with and urge the government of Ukraine to implement the deep, comprehensive, and timely reforms that are necessary to advance its Euro-Atlantic aspirations in support of a secure, prosperous, democratic, and free Ukraine. Ukraine has made tremendous strides in its 30 years of independence, and in particular, since the 2014 Revolution of Dignity. I'd like to cite just a few examples of progress in reform. First, Ukraine's passage of the Law on National Security in 2018 provided a legislative framework for aligning its national security architecture with Euro-Atlantic principles, and constituted a major step forward toward its goal of achieving NATO interoperability. In March 2020, President Zelensky signed an amendment that separates the positions of the Chief of the General Staff from the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. This new system of command and control separates force generation from force employment functions, which is a core feature of Western military structures. Progress on other key legislative actions include the passage of the Law on Defense Procurement and advancing a bill that could remake Ukraine's SBU into a modern security service guided by Western democratic standards. Additionally, this past year, we were encouraged by the adoption of both the National Security Strategy and National Military Strategy, which codify national strategic objectives and set conditions for reform across Ukraine's defense enterprise. While the government of Ukraine has made substantial progress, there are some areas I'd like to touch on that require further attention. The United States encourages Ukraine to pass legislation that clearly delineates the duties of the Ministry of Defense and the Ukrainian Armed Forces. This will better align Ukraine's defense enterprise with the core NATO principles of democratic civilian control of the military. Regarding defense industry, we urge Ukraine to adopt a strategy to better support the needs of the Ukrainian armed forces and Ukraine economic objectives while implementing effective corporate governance and supervisory board principles that are in line with global best practices. Similarly, 
the United States believes that the adoption of foreign direct investment controls based on national security interests are vital to protecting Ukraine's critical civil and defense infrastructure from foreign exploitation. Effective defense industry processes and institutions will lead to sustained improvement in combat capability, reduce corruption, and open the door to increased Western investments. The Department of Defense also strongly encourages Ukraine to continue to implement its law on defense procurement to create a globally competitive process, increase efficiency, and enhance transparency in the defense procurement cycle. Additionally, while there have been promising human resource management reforms, Ukraine must continue to advance these reforms to truly transform the Ukrainian armed forces and pave the way for a Western-style career management system. The United States is committed to assisting Ukraine with the implementation of these reforms, and we maintain a robust advisory effort to help modernize Ukraine's military in line with NATO principles and standards. The annual national programs under the NATO Ukraine Commission are an invaluable resource to take forward the reforms that are needed to advance Ukraine's NATO membership aspirations. I encourage Ukraine to make the best use of this dedicated forum, as well as the benefits of capacity building programs through NATO's comprehensive assistance package, and more recently through enhanced opportunities partner status to promote greater interoperability through exercises and training. The United States appreciates contributions to these efforts from like-minded allies through a coordinated requirements-driven process. There is always room for individual allies to step up bilaterally and do more in terms of resourcing these incredibly important NATO programs. Today, I'd like to close these brief comments by mentioning how much I look forward to seeing uh, continued progress building on what Ukraine has already achieved. It is critical for all of us to work together to maintain the momentum behind the reform effort. And the United States continues to welcome contributions and partnerships from allies and other partners. Finally, I also want to underscore the United States remains committed to continuing our political, economic, and military cooperation with Ukraine in support of an even stronger and more enduring strategic partnership between our two great nations. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, uh, Lara. As we have just a few minutes more together, let me uh, f follow up with, uh, with one or two uh, questions. Uh, but uh, before that, let me also uh, welcome our wonderful guest today, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine, uh, Olga Stefanishina, uh, who will be joining us and also following uh, on these discussions. But let me go back to you, Lara, for just a second. Um, you have proposed uh, a number of different steps that Ukraine still needs to take when it comes to uh, the defense reform it's undergoing. And there's, I can assure you here in Kiev, a full understanding of, of, of the need of these steps. But we also, have, as we've seen in the report, uh, have to underline that uh, Ukraine has aligned with NATO with a number of different uh, um, uh, initiatives. It's not only participating in NATO missions, uh, among others in Afghanistan, it has uh, been spending more than 2% uh, for its defense. And uh, finally, uh, it is uh, closely, inter uh, its interoperability in terms of military with NATO is also quite outstanding. It is said that uh, Ukraine implemented almost 19% of, uh, of, of NATO uh, of NATO legislature, uh, some of the new member states in NATO have not attained this kind of level of implementation. Do you think that uh, Ukraine stands a chance to join NATO in the next decade or so? Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to hear you cite 
some of the, the strong qualities and capabilities that Ukraine brings as a partner for the United States and for other NATO allies. The United States absolutely stands by the 2008 Bucharest Declaration, which states that one day Ukraine will be a member of NATO. And we are committed to working with Ukraine so that it can uh, progress the reforms that would be required for NATO membership. I will say it again today that no country has a veto, no third party country has a veto over a country's aspirations to join NATO. Yet there, Yet there is political hesitation, isn't there, uh, among a number of NATO countries whether to continue uh, the expansion of NATO eastward. This is not the case uh, when it comes to Western Balkans, but eastward it is. So don't you think Russia does have this strong feeling it still has a certain veto over, uh, over the expansion, over the enlargement of NATO uh, in what Russia calls its direct sphere of influence? Again, I would say Russia absolutely does not have a veto, and we must ensure that Russia does not have a veto over the sovereign choices of nations to be able to determine which, which alliances, which treaties they want to sign up to. In the case of Ukraine, we still do have a number of reforms that are necessary to ensure that the Ukrainian armed forces would in fact be ready uh, and NATO interoperable. So our focus is on that reform agenda and making sure that Ukraine would be ready uh, to join NATO. And again, no third party veto. Thank, Thank you so much, Laura, for this very important statement. Thank you for being with us uh, here and for your opening remarks to this panel. We will be coming back to these uh, discussions uh, um, with our distinguished speakers. And I will start again with welcoming uh, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, who is here with us. Uh, and my question uh, goes directly to you. I'm sure that as a person responsible for uh, Ukraine's integration with EU, but also with the transatlantic community, you often get the question, but why should we invite Ukraine? What uh, are the benefits of actually uh, having another member state with a hot conflict on its territory? Uh, I'm sure you hear a lot about the question of importing instability into NATO. How do you respond to these arguments, political arguments, uh, when it comes to uh, NATO enlargement? Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Laura, for your messages. No surprise to hear uh, very strong messages confirming that Ukraine and Georgia will become NATO members, but also confirming that Russia has no vote in, in NATO so far, but also uh, reaching back to Ukraine on the reforms agenda. This is a well-constituted well and placed messages you've heard uh, from many speakers today about what Ukraine is waiting for is the actions and practical steps. Uh, in terms of the uh, issue you're uh, raising, of course, there is uh, a number of answers how c Ukraine already contributes largely to the collective defense and security policy by strengthening and protecting basically southern flank of NATO, for which NATO so far has no strategy at all, while Ukraine has a strategy of defending its borders uh, by different means. But I would say also that basically it's not about Ukraine answering the questions, mm -hmm. it's about the obligations which has 13 years ago has been undertaken by allies. And 13 years after being silent, Ukrainians and Ukrainians Ukrainian president and leadership understand that silence brings no answer from the other side. So uh, basically, the Bucharest summit uh, is undoubtedly a historic event. Mm -hmm. And now we need a historic answers. And the historic answers is what we expect to see, not only um, uh, in the light of the upcoming summit and events, we want to see the answer and the day uh, which will be feasible for our countries, for Ukraine, to become the member of NATO. And there's no other timeline for where Ukraine can hear this answer, because 
uh, except of the fact that NATO is an, in, in light of next 10 years strategy for its development, uh, and the open door policy will be the new policy elaborated and presented in this NATO 2030 process. And it's absolutely the biggest mistake which could have ever been done by alliance by not giving the answer to Ukraine and Georgia to the question and position already fixed over the Bucharest summit. Uh, of course, what we see and what we hear right now from the principal allies, uh, which are not only the United States, but in many other capitals like France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands and, and Benelux countries, is that nobody wants to antagonize Russia. Mm -hmm. Everybody fear of irritating Russians and Russia. And um, sometimes we often hear that the answer to the question and the implementation of the promise which has been given to our countries back in 2008 will be feasible only after the leadership in Russia will be changed. By, but our answer is following. We have been uh, afraid to irritate Russia in 2008, but this has not prevented Russia from military interference into the Georgian territory few months after the Bucharest summit. And when we thought that this situation will not change and the world stands resilient towards Russian threat, in 2014, we faced the military aggression of our territory, the annexation of Crimea, and now Ukraine is in a situation where 14,000 of Ukrainian military servicemen without civilian personnel have been uh, murdered by Russian Federation. What answers and how else do we suppose not to irritate Russia? And we should face the reality. It's not about irritating Russia and protecting our country from military aggression. It's about trying to make a deal with Russia, China, and other players. But Ukraine is very strong in its position, saying that we are the players, and we are players on this, on this field, and we are on the agenda. We're not accepting in any way the format of getting no answer to the questions which were uh, discussed back in 2008. And now, uh, the very important issue you've raised about the, the contribution that Ukraine already gives to the collective security. To Ukraine, you, today, Ukraine is not only the security recipient, but a security donor in its region. First of all, as the leader in knowing and having the practical experience in tackling hybrid threats, which are not only the military ones. Ukraine has gained invaluable experience deterring Russian aggression on the traditional military battlefield, but also on, on a hybrid one. And Ukraine's experience has been largely absorbed by allies and NATO. Ukraine remains committed to building global security without nuclear weapons, and this has, it remains the commitment from our side also. Ukraine is the only NATO partner country who have participated in all major allied operations and missions, and it has already been confirmed by many speakers, including the one representing U.S. Ukraine, Ukrainian combat officers have been recognized one of the most professional, experienced, and, uh, and well respected by military servicemen of NATO, NATO military forces. Ukraine is one of the few countries in the Euro-Atlantic area that even without being a member of the alliance adheres to the requirement of the defense spending at the level no less than 2% of GDP. And this year, the legal obligation is to allocate 5% of GDP for security and defense sector. Ukraine has been largely under undergoing through the reforms agenda and hearing the question that reforms, reforms and reforms are needed, this is what we hear, that what we are committed to and that what we are implementing. Uh, the reform of the security and defense sector, civilian control over armed forces, allocation of 5% of GDP to, uh, to security and defense sector, adoption of the legislation on the military procurement, on the intelligence, on the state secret, based on NATO policy. This is really a historical decision which has been undertaken by this leadership, by this parliament, and implemented by this government. And the commitment is there. The legislation related to the rule of law and anti-corruption, which is essential for uh, triggering the confidence in uh, now stepping back on this agenda from our country, are really on track. What we need right now is not only the recognition of the successes and failures we have in our country, but mobilizing the political unity over bringing the ball back to Ukrainian field, 
is giving the membership action plan for our country, symbolizing that there is still a transatlantic unity, not only over those issues which are uh, usual suspects uh, and uh, are gaining the, um, the unity by default, but to make sure that the transatlantic allies still can get united over complicated questions, playing a bigger political role and showing that the NATO is really ready to play politically. Mm -hmm. So um, our message is really very simple. Ukraine remains and have always remained committed to the reforms agenda. There is no way to step back on this agenda. Moreover, this Friday, the Security and Defense Council has adopted the decision on stepping up Ukrainian efforts related to your Atlantic integration and all of the reforms which were mentioned by previous speaker They are part of this agenda. They are part of this work which will unite all the politicians and leaders in our country mm -hmm. But what Ukraine and all the region is looking for is the unity outside of our country The unity on EU and NATO integration is there whether there is a transatlantic unity over democratic transformations in our country is the answer we're looking for, and we expect to hear this uh, answer in the uh, next NATO summit, in the Foreign Affairs Council uh, in Riga, which will take place uh, this year already. But also, uh, we really hope that democratic nations, which are members of the NATO, would also be as democratic and as committed to values as Ukrainians are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me uh, just ask you about the upcoming NATO summit. What you said your expectations uh, are that somehow there will be a clear political statement, yes, uh, on, on, on future enlargements. But what do you think we can realistically expect? I mean, what would you want to see and what do you think we will see uh, next week? <laughs> Uh, well, we are all looking forward for this next week's summit and um, um, I want to say that we have so many friends among NATO allies who did their best to step in with the, giving the answers and stepping up with a clear clearness on the issue in terms of the open door policy for our country. But still there are a lot of skepticism and uh, whatever the wording we will hear and see uh, on Mon next Monday, uh, we know that there is still so many work to be done in capitals who are skeptical towards Ukraine, who still believe that they are afraid of Russia. And I believe that uh, um, enlightening on this issue is even more important on the wording we, we expect. Of course, uh, we know, and it was already confirmed by Mircea Joanna, that there will be a statement on the open door policy for Ukraine and for Georgia. But what is more important than us, uh, for, for us as a country showing the strategic patience, as NATO love to say, is to show the strategic commitment from the allies. And we, of course, hope to see that uh, the uh, NATO leaders will instruct their Minister of Foreign Affairs to step in with their clarity on the map for Ukraine already in December uh, over the Ministerial for NATO. So, uh, so far we do not see a perspective for this positive wording, but I know that many of the allies are fighting for that, fighting for clarity for our country, and I want to thank them all. You know uh, the capitals I'm reaching to, and I'm really grateful, and I hope that we will keep on building this unity, and this is only the beginning of the step uh, of the way we're going through and what is more important that Ukrainians and Ukrainian leadership will not step back with its rhetorics. We really need the answers and we really need to have and to see the summit where Ukraine will finally get the map. Thank you. Uh, my last question relates uh, a bit to also our Polish uh, experience. So uh, very often it is not realized how much of advocacy and lobbying there has been done by Central Europe in order to attain NATO, uh, NATO accession and enlargement. Actually, we not only had a full political commitment, bipartisan commitment of all political parties in Poland, in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, but we've also also had huge support of the Polish American community, the Czech American community, uh, the Hungarian American community, and I remember I wrote a book on this, the Ukrainian American community supported in 1990, and before that, the Polish, Hungarian, and Czech uh, accession in 1999. It was a huge help 
in the Congress to try to convince the senators uh, to vote for that enlargement. And having actually uh, gained the American support, we could then uh, move into, into um, other capitals, speak with the Germans, speak with the French, and say, listen, we are fully committed. So today when many people say that, you know, uh, NATO expanded, yes? I often tell them that's not true. We wanted to be there. It was our effort. We actually knocked on every door and there was no consensus until actually Madeleine Albright at some point said, okay, let's do this. The United States was even not convinced that NATO enlargement in the 1990s was a good idea. But having said that, that was a different geopolitical context. Yes, we had this wonderful democratic momentum where we could truly feel that, you know, everybody now is going to open up reform. Uh, Russia will no longer be perceived as an enemy. Who knows? Uh, our president Lech Wałęsa at that time even suggested that Russia should join NATO or maybe we should uh, create a NATO beast. Yes? So that was the type of optimism. That was the type of real belief that you know the world has changed fundamentally from a win-lose uh, perspective to a truly cooperative uh, format. How, however, do you see this possibility of NATO enlargement today? Because convincing countries who are already under siege in a way. Yes, Western democracies feel they're under huge siege with a democratic kind of recession almost in their countries. How do you see that? Does it, doesn't it make you a bit pessimistic? Uh, well, um, well, what makes us pessimistic is understanding that this is not uh, the decisions which are taken overnight. We understand that we're stepping in, uh, to a very, very long way of advocacy, working with each and every capitally, finding the arguments. But the positive thing is that I see the openness, even from the most skeptic countries, to accept the arguments, mm -hmm. to step in with the joint work of building the national unity in the specific capitals, but also looking for um, a political unity. Of course, uh, what makes us feel a bit more pessimistic is that we hear that this is not the right political momentum. And you definitely and your country and many of the countries heard about that. But we Ukrainians believe that this is the exactly the only possible political momentum. As you were referring to the US administration, US president is the the only president of the United States, knowing so much about our country, having such a strong sentiment towards our country, that basically this could be the only president who could emotionally and politically support our membership in NATO. And we believe that Ukraine uh, should um, count on the United States on its active role in supporting our country. And we see that there is a support to European, Euro-Atlantic uh, ambitions of our country. But we hope that US will step up in a more active role and we're working on that. Uh, and speaking about the momentum, again, this is new 10-year strategy. There are like 40, 14 allies who signed the letter to Secretary General to endorse the open door policy and give Ukraine and Georgia a perspective for membership. So this is the perfect time to start this discussion. 13 years, Ukraine has been quiet about membership action plan and the necessity to step up for that. We're starting this discussion now. We understand that this is a long way to go, but we think that there could not be a better political moment to step up with this discourse now, especially having support of those countries like Poland, Baltics, Romania, Bulgaria, who have undergone this way. They know how to build this unity, how to look for these arguments, and we're happy to be supported by these countries. And together, I'm sure we will step in in our nearest 10-year future. Thank you so much, Olka. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. It was a joy to have you here, Thank and you. I can only assure you that you have full support of Warsaw in this. And David, we're all looking forward to the summit. Let's hope there will be a rec recommitment of future uh, open uh, and future enlargements of NATO uh, and continuation of the open door policy. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Uh, Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, and now we move into our discussion. Uh, we have two distinguished guests with our uh, us who will be commenting on uh, the report. They will be commenting on the question of future of Ukraine uh, in NATO. Uh, also, uh, I would like to warmly welcome uh, Rasa Junkiewicz, who is uh, the member of European Parliament. She used to be the president of NATO Parliamentary Assembly, but also uh, our Georgian friend, uh, Irakli Pot Potchidze, 
who uh, is today the co-founder and vice president of the Georgian Institute for Strategic Th Studies. Thank you so much both for being with us and, and uh, thank you for your patience. So we had a longer introduction, but now we are all ready to go uh, also in our debate. So let me st st uh, start right away with a question directed to Rasa. Um, first and foremost, uh, Rasa, I think I wanted to ask you what, after listening to our discussion, but also uh, I hope also hearing uh, the report presented before, what do you think are the risks of not inviting Ukraine and Georgia uh, to NATO, especially if, uh, uh, as you come from a country who has joined uh, NATO in 2004, uh, which has ended for good, let's hope, this kind of sphere of influence of Russia in your region. So what do you think are the risks of not inviting Ukraine and Georgia into NATO? Thank you. First of all, thank you for the invitation. And uh, it was very interesting to, to listen uh, what uh, was already said, and I agree with uh, almost everything, especially Vice Prime Minister told us. Uh, and, but you know, I will start saying, uh, starting. I will start saying a little bit, maybe uh, some words of my upset because I am a little bit tired to speak the same more than ten years. Uh, starting from 2008, uh, when Bucharest summit uh, did not provide the membership action plan for Georgia and Ukraine, and it was a huge mistake. I still think, uh, and even it, uh, the developments uh, in eastern part of the uh, European continent only increased my understanding that it was a mistake not to invite. Of course, it was good that the phrase of open doors remains uh, in very important documents, but still, you know, answering your question, what will happen or what's, um, what, uh, I mean, what is, what is, what will happen if uh, Ukraine and Georgia will not be invited? Uh, we are, we live in European continent, which is still, uh, where is still completion of Europe not yet finished uh, after World War II. We commemorate every year Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact uh, when Europe was divided, but uh, the consequences of Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact still are on the map. I mean that this part, which we, we call Molotov, or Stalin side of that pact uh, is not yet solved at all. Mm -hmm. And we are um, uh, the generation which have to do this job. Uh, so we talked here about uh, uh, Vita Wright, that we uh, are not acknowledging we uh, NATO says always that uh, no third country has any veto right. Mm -hmm. But so NATO has to go forward with next steps for uh, a membership or more concrete plan for membership of Georgia and Ukraine uh, to show that really third countries, they don't have veto right. Mm -hmm. Because today, Still very many people think that this informal somehow veto right exists and about the consequences not to, to be invited. Uh, of course, reforms, despite that uh, Ukraine or Georgia will not be invited, they will bring for sure membership closer in the future, maybe in, in, in some years in, in, in front. So don't give up Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, good that at least you are not afraid of Russia, um, because for sure some countries, some politicians in, in, in allies in NATO are afraid of Russia. I will be frank and, and open. Uh, we need leadership, very strong leadership, new leaders in NATO and the EU to not to be afraid to go forward with memberships, both, by the way, memberships. But the most important issue that 
membership or membership action plan can help Russia to be different in future. The only way, I, as I understand to actually, the only way to help Russia to be different is Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. It is a little bit different uh, question uh, issue because they, they are not willing to join NATO, maybe willing, but they cannot do this because of their constitution. Um, constitution. So this is most important to, to understand and to help Russia to be different because without that, Russia will remain imperialistic and, uh, uh, and uh, this territorial aspect for uh, current um, uh, Kremlin regime is very important and uh, they will act more aggressively if we will not understand that not being afraid of Russia and providing memberships or at least uh, much more clear plan for memberships, both memberships and especially NATO, first of all, uh, we, we, we would be able to help Russia to, to, be, uh, to, to stay uh, to, to become different with different understanding of their role in the eastern part of European continent. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank, thank you very much, Rasa. I had a, a chance uh, to, to moderate a panel some time ago with you, and I, I know how outspoken you are, so, so I'm sure you will not mind my question. Uh, when you look today uh, at uh, other NATO members, who do you think uh, is the strongest blocking force of future enlargement? Uh, of uh, Who is the most afraid? You often say, you know, some countries are afraid of Russia. So who are they and how can we convince them uh, that actually uh, NATO enlargement uh, is a deterrent to uh, a imperialistic Russia and not, uh, not uh, the opposite way around? I don't know if, if it's, uh, it would be very good to name the countries with their names, but I think that very many of uh, those, they are here, they understand this and discussions in, in countries uh, like like Germany, France, or uh, or Netherlands, or other countries, we see of, uh, open debates in their parliaments, or uh, open debates uh, among political parties. We see that uh, NATO membership or providing membership action plan for Georgia, Ukraine, is not on their agenda. On on those on political parties in some countries, there is. Um, unfortunately, uh, quite large agreement among political parties not to provide uh, NATO, NATO membership action plan. So, but uh, on the other hand, it was almost the same when we, Lithuanians, I mean, uh, were on the path to join NATO. Almost the same situation. But uh, we were knocking, knocking, and knocking. We're walking, doing a lot, uh, ask, looking for uh, advocates, uh, in, in advocating for other countries. They were members of NATO, for example. Poland did a lot. Uh, Nordic countries like Denmark, uh, they did a lot, a lot uh, as uh, to, to push forward. Their interest, of course, was not to be. Um, um, uh, the last, I mean, geographically uh, to the East NATO country. But on the other hand, it, it was also uh, done together with us. So that's why it's so important for Ukraine to be active um, everywhere, but especially with those countries, they, they are now more skeptical. They know themselves. It's, it's not necessary to name these countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and this is this is. But also, on the other hand, leadership of the United States always is very important for those countries as well uh, to use uh, strong uh, leadership of countries they are most powerful in in NATO alliance. Thank you Thank so, you so much, much, Rasa. I will come back with other questions to you. Let me move now to Iraq Lee and uh, Georgia TBDC. Uh, wonderful to have you here. Welcome. Uh, Irakli, I wanted to start with a, a, a question uh, to you in terms of uh, Ukrainian and Georgian contribution to transatlantic security. Uh, what, what would you see? We, we heard a lot uh, about Ukrainian contribution to this security. How would you define Georgia's contribution 
uh, to transatlantic security as a strong argument for future NATO enlargement? Well, thank you very much for, for the invitation. I, uh, I appreciate this. Um, I'm also very sad that I'm not able to join you in, in Kiev. It would have been great. Um, it's also about talking last. You know, all the good points have already been raised, but I'll try to um, bolster some of them and uh, give you a perspective from Georgia, from Tbilisi, that um, will, will support and advocate for, for Georgia's inclusion um, in, in, in uh, NATO. Of course, I mean, um, it, it, we've been talking about this contribution for a very, very long time. Let it be about the, um, the, the collective defense efforts of, of the partners and the aspirants right now that Georgia has been very active in participating in different formats uh, when it comes to interoperability um, and, and then in all, all other uh, fora that have been um, extremely important for Georgia as well for, for developing its own capabilities, but also the crisis management uh, and, and the crisis engagement that the Georgia was part of. Throughout the, um, the last decade and more, Georgia has been at the forefront of this contribution. Um, as a per capita contributor and the highest per capita contributor with a small nation being so, um, uh, so uh, I would say adamantly going forward with this and then paying uh, a high price vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. Um, I mean, it has to be very clear that, I mean, since 2008 and even before, Georgia has been, uh, I mean, defending the, the very values that the, um, the NATO has been based on. And, and the question of what might be coming uh, if, if Georgia and uh, Ukraine are not included if, um, it's some very, very close future. I and mean, I think it's what's happening in the region right now. Um, when we have a, a general meltdown of uh, democratic tendencies and democracy as a concept in the world, but look at the region. I mean, in the region, we have uh, basically a cleansing out of any uh, free space. I mean, of course, that, that's partly about Russia, uh, about the internal politics of Russia, but also look at the, uh, the Belarus. Um, and, and all the other countries are in the region looking. And, if you ask me, and all the elites in the region are looking at Georgia and Ukraine, seeing that these countries have been at the forefront of this fight, have been trying to defend uh, their democracies, albeit sometimes, and uh, sometimes, I, I mean, the, the criticism should be taken, that the flawed democracy, but we still have been very much adamant to go the Russian way. So I think it's extremely important to understand that by, by supporting Georgia and Ukraine, you are directly or indirectly supporting the trends that you want to persist in the region. Mm -hmm. As time goes by, we'll be seeing that these screws are gonna be tighter and tighter on, on the spaces that still provide this glimmer of hope. So if you ask me, the biggest um, contribution that Georgia and Ukraine can do right now is to create the arc of stability around the Eastern flag of, of, of NATO uh, when we talk about the Black Sea uh, plans of NATO and to be more engaged, um, it's good that it, it, it started to talk about this. And now it has been very much a policy that they started to think about. And Georgia and Ukraine can provide the best of the opportunities in the region when it comes to the capabilities, when it comes to its uh, location, but also the ideational basis of what kind of um, countries, states, political systems we would like to um, build and continue to build. So I think these are very important points, especially in this context, because this context is actually telling everyone that if NATO wants to be more relevant, and I have to be loud and speaking about this, because many times the criticism that has been coming to NATO is that the alliance has been becoming obsolete, which I don't agree with, of course, but this, this has been voiced many, many times. So I think in order to create the relevance and continue to be relevant in this world, in this VUCA world, we have to continue to be strongly supporting and advocating for the instruments which are part of, the, of, of NATO's um, way of thinking, which is open door policy. Because if NATO doesn't take serious open door policy in, in the uh, region, which has the biggest relevance now for the world, I think that this re relevance will be diminished. Mm -hmm. And um, these are very strong points considering what is happening once again in the world and what is happening in the region. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Thank so, you so much, much. Uh, Irakli. I have one uh, more follow-up question to you, but also to, to Rasa, because our panel today is NATO enlargement as tool for enhancing democracy and go good governance. But to tell you the truth, uh, I feel from, from a perspective of Poland that the true game changer was our preparation to accession to the European Union. The amount of reforms, chapter closed, negotiations uh, that we had to undergo, uh, the extensivity yes, of, of that process was so immense. Uh, it took almost 10 years. And I think that gave really the foundations uh, for enhancing democracy and good governments. So what would you both, uh, Irakli, I'll start with you, say to those who argue, maybe let's start with EU enlargement and then look at NATO. Um, of course, knowing that EU enlargement is so much more complicated and it's a process that depends so much more uh, reforms and preparation. So, Irakli, what, what do you think about this argument? Well, I, I do, that, but I'm just to throw this thesis right up in the air. I, I don't think that these are um, not parallel paths. They can be parallel paths for, for, for both. And, and I don't think that they're mutually exclusive, to be very clear. And there shouldn't be any negative dichotomy when it comes to that. I think that... Um, from a, a perspective of our countries, I mean, we are happy that we have the association agreement that we are moving forward with and with all the perks which are followed uh, with, with that. Um, I mean, it, it's definite um, a success. Of course, you know, it's a gradual success that, you know, uh, the approximation takes time, you know, it takes uh, a bit more time to reap all the benefits, but we definitely see that um, there is a, a positive dynamic, let it be the um, the, uh, the trade turnover, let it be the mobility, let it be all, all dimensions of the, the mobility, the, the, the education of the human mobility, et cetera, et cetera, which definitely create a very important, um, um, very, very important drivers for, for Georgia's democratic transformation to continue. And, and this, is, this is definitely the case. But at the same time, I, I, as I said, you know, I have to go back to that. Um, I mean, EU can provide a very important uh, soft power element and, and uh, soft power element that can bolster the Georgia's approximation to the, um, the, to the West as such. But when it comes to the security umbrella, and we have to be very clear, um, of course, NATO is, 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 is the organization that we should aim to, to continue to uh, embrace. Uh, because the hard power element is important, but as I said, it's not, I mean, we don't perceive NATO only as a hard power um, uh, uh, tool for Georgia or umbrella of, of, of security for, for ourselves, because we do see it as ide ideational uh, organization, which has values, the, the, the values that we are aspiring to, to uh, to to um, ingrain in our DNA and continue to to do that. So um, I think that they shouldn't be mutually exclusive, and they can continue hand in hand. Uh, uh, Iraqi, but a very short answer to to, to my question: If the, there was a political consensus in the West that yes, we have an open door policy, a fast track to EU enlargement, and then we'll make decisions on NATO, would you take such a bargain? Would you take that deal? Well, if I were, if I if I am in the shoes of, of uh, ruling um, a part of, of the government, uh, which makes the, the decisions, I, I think that you know I would take it, of course, because right now Georgia doesn't have any mm -hmm. on the table. I have to be very frank about it. But but as a as, as someone who is in the shoes of a, a policymaker. Uh, I was also going to be thinking about the security guarantees because security guarantees are extremely important mm -hmm. because that is the core of how the prosperity can come, how you can secure your uh, democratic future as well. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in our neighbor, uh, neighborhood, that's how it is. Uh, Rasa, and a short answer from you as well, because you sit in the European Parliament. Do you think this sequence of EU first NATO is, is, is a realistic one? Do you think it's just an argument to get off the table the discussions on potential NATO enlargement? No, EU and ships are complementary to one another. When we look to Western Balkans, it's opposite. Membership in NATO is more political uh, decision. Uh, and I think both, especially Georgia today, uh, they are, is ready for NATO membership uh, from military, military uh, readiness, mm -hmm. because uh, I don't see any difference of those uh, Western Balkan countries, they became members of NATO and Georgia, which is really 
uh, today is very important partner of, of NATO already. So my understanding is that NATO first EU and then to uh, prepare for EU membership, which is long, long distance to go with reforms. But on another hand, of course, both more security assistance through NATO is needed and greater EU, EU involvement in economic, social and other affairs. So uh, I think uh, both uh, uh, memberships are so important for uh, all these countries, like for us. It's like, you know, to say who is more important for you, mother or father? Both are important in the family. So uh, it's, it's, it's not, not full family without, with one, without one or another. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you for you. that uh, point. Uh, we have 25 minutes left, and I would like to leave maybe the question of enlargement uh, for now, because both of you are, uh, are NATO experts. You both served in the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of NATO. So I wanted to ask you, what are your expectations, again, apart from p potential, potential discussions on, on, the, on the open door policy? What are your expectations when it comes to the upcoming summit next week? Joe Biden is coming to... Uh, Europe, it's a huge, huge, uh, a huge uh, trip. Uh, he will be in the United Kingdom, he will be in Brussels. He's meeting Putin in Geneva. So what do you think will happen at the NATO summit? And also, uh, do you think that the question of NATO enlargement will be part of his discussions with Vladimir Putin, or you think that will definitely not find its way uh, there? Rasa, if I can stay with you. you. I would not like to, uh, to think that uh, Biden will discuss enlargement with Putin if we say that uh, it's up to NATO to decide and it's not uh, any third country uh, veto uh, can, can provide for, for such decision. decision. Of course, it would, uh, it would not. But uh, we, we, of course, it's a very important week. Uh, this next week will be with all these important uh, uh, meetings, but I am not expecting that Putin will become different or uh, China will change their attitudes or uh, understanding. Uh, what do we need to have more unity on both shores of both sides of Atlantic? This is what we need on both strategies towards Russia and towards China as well. So here, my expectations are that it would be more common understanding than it was before. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we need uh, concrete steps, not only just nice photos and uh, uh, smilings and good, uh, um, uh, nice words for, for each other. We need, we need a lot to do, including trade agreement, including, including NATO, I mean, enlargement or Eastern partnership um, uh, for European Union, especially uh, more, more leadership. Uh, the, 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 the global, 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 the world is, is not easy today. So uh, unity, I, I mean that for me, most important is unity of uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, bond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and let me follow up on this, Rasa. What do you think are, are the biggest challenges for that unity at the moment? Uh, because yet, yet again, we have a clear uh, American president commitment to, to American security guarantees uh, in Europe. Uh, a, uh, the president is a big proponent of, of, of NATO and also of the European Union. But where do you think we might see those challenges for unity next week and, and, and the months to come? So the same challenges I already mentioned, Russia and China. <laughs> Both those, those challenges are, are most of maybe some, some, in some countries in the European Union, some countries have uh, uh, maybe still some different understanding. I, I don't think that the... There are, they think that uh, 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 in, in European, in, in everywhere in the Western, so-called Western uh, democracies, uh, everybody have much more realistic approach today towards uh, Russia and China. NATO also mentioned China as a rival, as a challenge, as a threat. 
uh, it, it was not before many some years ago. Today is different situation, of course, approach is different and uh, much more realistic. But the instruments, how to act, the strategy towards, especially I, I, I would say about Russia, is still different because if we, we talked here about that some people are afraid of Russia. So this is number one, to understand that we have a, a lot of capabilities and possibilities to act and to deal and to use these instruments and to believe that Russia can be different in the future. If someone, I don't know, in one another capital thinks that Russia forever will be uh, as it is now with autocratic regimes. So of course, maybe some will think that it's necessary to have dialogue, to speak with Putin, to have some deals, maybe to, uh, to discuss uh, uh, some interests, what, what in their interests to discuss and so on, and interests uh, um, uh, around their boundaries or, or borders. So this is, this is, this is what uh, I would like to see, to speak about the common strategy for the future with leadership and strategy. Your expectations for next week. What are the expectations also in Georgia? Definitely. I mean, we want to see more value-based leadership because, um, I mean, the, the change in the U.S. administration and with the coming of the Biden administration and Biden himself, who knows the region, um, there is definitely an expectation here in uh, Tbilisi. I also know that in Kiev that there is going to be more attention paid to the region as such. Um, of course, I mean, I have to be very frank once again because I like uh, to say um, things how they are perceived and then perceptions are extremely important but we have to be very clear that um, there is a perception that the U.S. has been disengaged from the region for quite some time and uh, that's definitely not good uh, for us at least because we continue to be strategic partners of the U.S. and we continue to espouse and to, to be aspiring to, to be part of the, the world that um, the, the uh, the majority of the Western countries um, identify themselves with. So that, that has been um, um, a case. So we want to see kind of a more engagement. Of course, the second point is that we want to see consistency. Uh, let it be in the messaging, of course, but also in the, the messaging and acts. Those are two very important parts. Why? Because Russia does interpret those things as weaknesses. If they don't see the, um, if they don't see uh, a consistency in messaging, if they see that there is a blurriness, they love the gray zones. They will try to exploit it. Mm -hmm. That's definitely how they act in major capitals here in Georgia as well. If they see that you know there is a consistency in messaging, but there is definitely not a consistency in messaging plus the actions they will try to exploit it once again and they will try to create this um, very clear messages here in Georgia that yes you know it's all about talk but there is no walk so I do agree we need more engagement of the major players here in the region we definitely do need to see more clarity more consistency in messaging but also acts and those are very important parts but once again when we talk about the summit of course and when we talk about the open door policy I think uh, the time has come that, uh, you know, it's not an inertia anymore. And once again, you know, it has been inertia, unfortunately, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And there has to be a very uh, clear sense about the resuscitation and revitalizing this policy. Uh, for us, uh, for, for the local opinion makers to see, um, can there be any clarity? You know, um, we talk about the 2030 right now and uh, the NATO is rethinking its future. Where is open... Uh, door policy there? Where is the NATO expansion and enlargement? Is, the, is it happening? What is the expectation that should we, I mean, we should have? I, I think that those are the points that definitely um, should, should be understood that, you know, worries us and then we are uh, pretty much uh, worried about this. But when it comes to uh, Biden-Putin meeting, um, once again, um, I don't think that, you know, um, NATO enlargement is such uh, should be uh, the, I mean, it's not going to be the core discussion. I, I'm pretty sure it's the, the case because there is um, a different momentum for that. And uh, that's definitely not going to be the key to, to the conversation. But once again, I, I think it's extremely important to understand that, you know, whoever talks to Putin, let it be in the solo or let it be in the kind of a, 
um, a different uh, multiplayer formats. You know, it should be a unity in terms of one front. Mm -hmm. It should be understood in Moscow that you know the power projection comes from the unity of the uh, of the major players, and if they don't communicate it in the right way and don't give the the proper red lines, um, whatever that can be. And we, um, I think it's, it's it's clear that you know Russia will continue to be what it is. The neighborhood has been ravaged by the Bali for a very uh, for a very long time, so the time comes you know to communicate the right way, um, and and I think that there is a high time for that. Mm -hmm. uh, let me build on that a question to 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 both of you. Uh, because you've spoke extensively also in the past on Russia and Vladimir Putin. What do you think are his calculations when it comes to the Biden uh, administration? I mean, we saw a very clear uh, military buildup a few weeks ago here on the Ukrainian border. Uh, many have interpreted this as a kind of, you know, uh, a preparation for political talks with, uh, with Joe Biden. What do you think on the Kremlin as they prepare for that meeting next week? What are the discussions? What 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 do you think they they are expecting, and uh, uh, what can of course we expect as well? Uh, Irak, Irak, maybe I'll start with you this time. Okay. Um, well, I, I definitely think that their strategy has been throughout this time to divide the allies, mm -hmm. and they will continue to divide allies uh, as they think it should be done to create uh, various agendas for different players uh, to buy time because they definitely see that as uh, you know the, when the new president comes you know it, i mean there is always a lot of um, expectations and and oftentimes they know that these expectations can be different from the reality and and buying time can help to create uh, more of a um, flaws in that expectation game you know there is going to be less delivery more talk and, and create this um, uh, feeling that nothing is going to change. It's still going to be the same, and, and, and that's going to be the case. So I think that uh, the, the divide part uh, is going to be the same, and it's going to continue to be the case, You know, trying to uh, create as many rifts or divisions inside the uh, trans transatlantic unity. Um, but Russia it might be harder hard. with the Biden administration in place, yes? It's, it will not be that easy to, to make that rip between the Germans, the French. Uh, uh, so, 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 so do you think our calculations are changing or not really? Is the division, divide and rule the only I policy at the moment? Thinking, and I want that to be the reality, mm -hmm. but let, let's see. Let, let's see how things will go. Mm -hmm. Because we saw, I mean, let's be frank, you know, we saw a very harsh statements, um, you know, we, we saw... Uh, pretty much name calling of Putin, and then suddenly there is an ask for a meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I do understand that you know it's the big, uh, the big game thing, but still, you know how how do those two things rhyme together? And and uh, once again, you know, I mean, I, I mean, we do a lot of uh, uh, thinking about this, but once again, it's about the reality that we create and the the perceptions form the reality. I think we have to remember that. Mm -hmm. So whatever the perceptions are going to be there. At certain point, it will form the reality. It's too, and after it's been framed, it's very difficult to get out of it mm -hmm. most of the time. So I hope once again that the walk, I mean, the talk is is also coupled with a walk, mm -hmm. and we have the the harmony between the two. Thank you so much, uh, Rasa. Uh, again to you, the Kremlin's calculations uh, today. What are they? And also, how would you interpret that, that military buildup we were experiencing uh, a few weeks ago? The Kremlin is playing their playbook. <laughs> their playbook is hybrid warfare, to divide, to split, to, uh, to, to, you know, to organize their politics, to, uh, to show for their own people and to the world that this guy who was named as uh, uh, killer, that he is uh, part of uh, a political system, global political system. And uh, we, we are in a very, very difficult situation. Of course, I mean democracies. I understand that the only person, only politician can uh, can try to speak with Putin is, of course, the president of the United States. We, we saw what Mr. Borrell, 
uh, when he came to Moscow with the, uh, with the really uh, open heart, maybe I would say, and uh, was trying to build up uh, some kind of, of new um, bridges, uh, but it didn't happen. Uh, so uh, we will see, but uh, up until today, I think that Putin needs most more than Biden this common photo on all newspapers all over the world and to um, have this approvement of uh, his regime that uh, they are part of this of this global global game i understand that it's, uh, it's very complicated because we have a problem with a country with nuclear country and this built up you mentioned was exactly to show, to frighten, to uh, to show to European European uh, part of our democracies and and to, to the United States that look, we we can do everything we want, and nobody wants war, of course, uh, no no one wants the war, um, and it's it's complicated for democracies because when such kind of politicians, I don't want to say politicians, sorry for that, uh, uh, dictators, they are playing these games and playing hybrid warfare against democracies. It's not easy for democracies because we have election every four year and people are exhausted, are, af are afraid of course also. They are uh, not, not everyone maybe is able to understand and they are pushing their governments uh, to, to, to try to speak, to have a dialogue with such dictators. But some people in Lithuania started to speak about 1939, what we see now uh, next, next uh, to, to, uh, on, on our agenda today. But uh, maybe not. Maybe we will avoid such, uh, such situation. But, uh, mm, but for me, my last sentence is, as I understand, the only right way to uh, to change the situation is containment. Mm -hmm. Containment of both dictators. Today we are two in one, mm -hmm. Lukashenko and Putin. They are two in one. There's no separate uh, mm -hmm. dictators. They are doing everything together. So containment would be the right politics. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, maybe not everybody today are ready for that in Western countries. Thank you, Rasa, for that point. I think that the only upside of the current situation in Belarus is that we know now very clearly who is who. Yes, there has been some denial for some time. Uh, I don't have to remind the audience here that Lukashenko was the honest broker of the Minsk agreements just a few years ago, seen as, as a kind of, you know, uh, even some sanctions have been lifted against him back in 2015. Uh, and now it is clear that, as Rasa said, we have two dictators uh, in this part of Europe working hand in hand. And it is a major challenge, if not the challenge for NATO. And now as we have just a few minutes left, um, I want to uh, go back to this uh, big uh, question of strategy for NATO, NATO 2030. There has been a report, a very extensive report, uh, prepared by a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, advisors to the Secretary General of NATO, which clearly states in the 40 pages or so, what are the biggest challenges to come in the next 10 years for NATO. And it is a no surprise, but uh, that Russia is, of course, the first major, major challenge that we face. But there's almost also so many other things in that report. There is China, there is hybrid warfare, there is emerging uh, new disruptive technologies, uh, there is climate change, there is the southern neighborhood, the Middle East, and so on and so forth. And the big question to you, because naturally the report was a kind of consensus-based document where we um, brought together all uh, 30 member states and s asked them, you know, what's important for you? What do you think we should be focusing on uh, as NATO? 
but having so many different you know, potential threats and challenges, uh, are you not afraid of, of this kind of uh, you know, lack of focus of, of NATO? Uh, as we had NATO during the Cold War, the focus was very clear to contain the Soviet Union. Now with the number of different threats coming from different directions, that might no longer be clear. And of course, at the expense of other challenges. So, you are not afraid uh, of, of this kind of again this, uh, uh, this this kind of too many too many focuses of NATO uh, in the future. Irakli, if I can ask you first. Well, definitely. I mean, the conventional threats should continue to be the major uh, focus of NATO because that's why it was uh, mm -hmm. created, and I'm pretty sure that uh, that that is going to be the case. But I think no less important should be the hybrid threats. Because Russia has made it very clear that it's going to be uh, using this playbook uh, in the years to come. It has been very successful, you know. It, I mean, in, in many of the countries that we could never think of, I mean, look at the United States, Germany, France, it has been on an offensive there as well. So um, once and for all, I think we have to understand that uh, the, the hybrid threats are, are, is, go is going to be here and is going to stay here. And then um, definitely that thinking shouldn't disappear. Of course, um, I, I definitely think that um, in the years to come, we will see more of that uh, and not less of that. And um, the thinking should definitely be there. Um, I, I think that, uh, that there are a few points to be made about how NATO should see itself. And I think that adaptability is going to be one of the things. It should, it should I mean, I understand that it's, a, it's an alliance. It brings together with uh, member states with desperate um, um, resource base understanding sometimes. But I think that, that the key should be the adaptability because the next uh, decade or so and beyond is going to be a very uncertain time. We saw with COVID what is happening. Things have been turned up, uh, uh, upside down. And I think that the biggest thing is going to be the adaptability. Mm -hmm. So the way the, the resource planning is going to be there, the defense capabilities and the reactive mode that can be activated should be um, based on that. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to kind of go beyond that because your question was broad. So I, I just don't, I, I want to go beyond the, the, the concrete um, instruments. And of course, the agility. Um, that's definitely going to be something to be aiming at. Um, but um, I, I, I personally think that perceptions matter, as I, as I have said. And uh, most often, um, we, we don't, I mean, sometimes the way we project ourselves is, is more important than who we are. Let's be very frank. So I think that on that part, there is the, the, the work which should be done and the unity and the commitment to, to um, the shared values and those policy instruments, which are part of this document and the future uh, thinking should be also defended and defended very, very forcefully. And here are Georgia and Ukraine who are ready to be there. Of course, um, and the, the different types of contributions we can have. Resources, um, thinking let it be, but also the ideational, the value-based unity, which we can provide and can be role models here in the region. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Irakli. And Rasa, the last word goes to you because we have three and a half minutes. So uh, again, uh, the question of uh, how should we focus more uh, on the more, uh, more uh, defense uh, type of threats? Uh, what do, how should NATO look like in 2030? You know, it's it's much better document than I expected. I will be uh, frank and open. And going back uh, to the years before 2014, uh, it is large, is huge step forward. I remember very well the year 2008, 2014, 12, when I I was a minister of defense in Lithuania. You know, today is is totally different NATO mm -hmm. with the totally different understanding, and NATO is back to its roots, I would say, uh, for uh, collective defense of uh, NATO territory, first of all. And uh, mm, uh, strategy, remember strategy 2010 uh, adopted in Lisbon, uh, which uh, where Russia was at that time uh, a strategic partner of, uh, of, of NATO. Uh, so today, uh, really, it's a realistic uh, approach, maybe uh, every region, uh, each uh, NATO country uh, has uh, 
um, different understanding on on uh, threats, but it's understandable, of course, threats in the south of Europe are different than threats here in, in the region we live, Poland, Lithuania and other other countries. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's comprehensive and, uh, and NATO is on good track, I would say, because NATO is back on, on, uh, on the track. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank so, you so much, much, Rasa. I think that's a very good point at the end. We tend to forget that uh, Russia's actions uh, here in Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, the war in Donbas, but also now from a perspective 2008 and the war in Georgia has built more unity than we've ever had on the question of, of Russia. You could see that in EU foreign policy very much. I think uh, the Borrell trip you talked about was just another kind of wake up uh, also of EU institutions of what is possible and what is not possible in relations with Russia, but more importantly in NATO. Yes, it's, it's uh, enhanced forward presence, uh, the fact that we see uh, both NATO and uh, American troops uh, in uh, Central Europe uh, enhanced. Uh, that is all a consequence of Russia's actions, but also a big call uh, of unity. Uh, so uh, as we conclude this panel, a panel discussion on Ukraine in Georgia in NATO 2030. I would like to um, thank very warmly our speakers. Rasa Irakli, thank you so much for being here with us from Brussels and Tbilisi. Uh, I also uh, thank the Deputy Prime Minister. I also thank uh, Lara Cooper, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, for today's discussion. Uh, and we hope uh, to see you uh, soon, not only today, but also tomorrow as we continue the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs> so please <laughs>
um, when lots of people can produce their energy by, by themselves. So I'm quite convinced that it makes sense not only to look on the, on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, it makes sense to look on the change of ener energy system as a whole. Taking a look on both parts of this, uh, of this sentence, so what about Nord Stream 2? <laughs> yes, um, Nord Stream 2 is a, is a, a pipeline which was uh, decided years before, not only in Germany, from, uh, not only, it's not a point of view it, from my perspective, it's a, a, a consortium of more than 100 uh, companies in, in lots of European uh, 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 countries, and I'm quite convinced that in the next year um, uh, we will um, uh, need uh, the, the methane from these pipelines to make sure that we can succeed in our energy sh shift system. Okay, quite diplomatic answer, but we will continue the topic <laughs> of Nord Stream 2 tomorrow. Nord Stream 2 and the new Green Deal. What is, what is the relations between these two, two, two terms? It will be the highlight of tomorrow. Meanwhile, we are moving to another question, and it will be on arms deliveries. So while strongly supporting the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, again, the vast majority of German politicians absolutely opposes any military assistance to Ukraine. Of course, like fearing the Kremlin's reaction. And yes, we do understand that war can only be solved through diplomatic negotiations. But uh, meantime, why does Germany categori categorically refuses to provide Ukraine with any means to better protect our serving men, protect our civilians. Now, we're strongly convinced that negotiation is the right way and uh, to, under, uh, to, to make support in um, um, uh, other ways than delivering we weapons. Uh, and we have some uh, very strong um, economic action plans where we foster renewables, where we foster energy efficiency. And I'm responsible in the German, uh, in the German government for the inter-societal connection between Germany and the Ukraine and other countries. And on that basis, I, I want to emphasize that uh, negotiations, that un understanding is, uh, in, in, in my point of view, the most uh, important way to change uh, the things, and uh, we're not the, the weapon dealers, we're the, uh, the ones who want to make sure uh, that uh, there is a possibility for negotiation and for getting out of this conflict. Without undermining, uh, uh, underestimating inter-societal connection, but uh, unfortunately cultural dialogue and other democratic support will just not help us to demine the territory of Ukraine. And you know that now it will be the huge issue for the next 30 years if we start it right now. So what actually stops maybe Germany from providing us with just armed vehicle, medical vehicles, mm. or uh, equipment for demining Ukrainian territory? Now, we are, we are not accepting uh, the situation in Donbas. And we, in every speech in the German Bundestag, I emphasize uh, that it's uh, a, a big issue that uh, the Crimea's illegal, um, uh, 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 the, the, the annexion of the Crimea's Ill illegal. And um, beside this fact, uh, we have to find uh, a basis for negotiation and for, for peacekeeping me methods in the next decades. It's my responsibility uh, to bring people together to make sure that they trust each other, and I know it's a, it's a big thing, it's a, a thick wood to, to, to drill through it, uh, but uh, it's the only way to have a peacekeeping situation in Europe. Negotiations is the way, but negotiation a position is much stronger where you, where you are just protected on when, when you have something to act, their attacks. Okay, so third question, Mr. Sadhoff is about fighting corruption, because it's one of the main topics of our conference. And recently, the Biden administration uh, has announced that the fight against corruption and kleptocracy will be the major priority of their team. How far could Germany contribute to this global fight against corruption when a lot of this actually corrupt wealth is parked in Europe? Mm -hmm. I think um, a fight of corruption is essential uh, to build up a, a, 
a community, a, 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 comp, a, a, a country uh, which is able uh, to do their connection to the Eastern Partnership and, and, and more than that. And uh, uh, I see some uh, first movements of, of the Ukrainian country against uh, corruption and I think it's the right way and uh, we would like to support that. Uh, it's the rule of law. I always I'm asked, uh, how is it possible to get some uh, foreign investors in, in the Ukrainian uh, country? And uh, one of the major points is uh, to set up a rule of law which is reliable for the investors, where the investors can say, okay, it makes sense, and I know that my invest is not a stranded one. And uh, that is rule of law and uh, fighting against corruption, which I think you are in a good way. Okay, but what about uh, the Germany itself? Does Germany has efficient legislative, administrative means for you as, as like to counter cryptocracy? You mean we inside the country? We work against the cor we yeah. work for the curb. No, no, I don't mean it. Okay, I hope you are not. Okay, just explain it again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry, English is not my mother tongue. But I would like maybe to ask you tell us more about internal German instruments to fight cryptocracy. Ah, I see. Okay. I don't, then I understood you right, thanks. Um, okay, we have um, a very complicated system to fight against corruptcy. Uh, I think one of the major uh, tasks is uh, uh, to pay the uh, public office as well, <laughs> so that they don't uh, need to find other solutions to feed their family. And uh, of course, we have an, an organization fighting against corruptcy, and we have some regulations. I was a mayor before I became a member of the parliament, and I had to obey these rules. I had to, uh, had to give more than one offer, and uh, I had to find a, a transparent uh, project uh, to, to tell the people in a transparent way why I was deciding uh, this company or that company. And uh, this is uh, the basis for fighting against un uh, corruption. Yeah, transparency at every, every level. And tomorrow, actually, we will continue to talk about level of city administrations with the city mayor of Kiev. Uh, yes, I, I read in the program. I invite you to join this conversation yes. also as a participant. Thank you for answering my questions. Thank you for supporting Ukrainian democratic development. And we hope for better in our Nord Stream 2 <laughs> conversations <laughs> with Germany. All the best for you, and thank you for having me here. Thank you. А від розмов політичних хочеться перейти нарешті uh, дом якої no, сили мистецтва. Uh, і в сусідній студії зі мною tool. вже розташувався and, uh, легендарний in the room uh, next to ours uh, дуже успішно is представив нашу країну на міжнародному which, uh, successfully introduced Ukraine at Eurovision. Uh, хоча за голосуванням uh, це Even не була перемога, але uh, перемога win, based on для наших сердець це перемога глядацькому голосуванню. Hearts. And we were second based on uh, people's votes. And after the contest, uh, their song took first spot in Spotify. And this is the first Ukrainian song which got into world chart billboard. And Shum is also the first song which in it's fully Ukrainian song, which was sung in, Ukra in Eurovision. So let's make some noise. <laughs> 